You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Bet like the pros with the world's largest sports book right at your fingertips. Circus Sports is now available in Illinois. Hi, I'm Derek Stevens. I've been a lifelong sports better and I'm the owner of Circus Sports. We're excited that the Circus Sports app is now ready for action. Experience big app bets with high betting limits, tight money line splits, and more. Now you can download, fund, and bet like a pro from anywhere in Illinois. Download your new bookie today at CircusSports.com. If you or someone you know may have a problem with gambling, call 1-800-GAMBLER or text ILGAMB to 833-234. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Hello everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War, episode 33. This episode is coming at you a bit late due to the fact that I've been pretty sick over the last several days, and for the most part unable to talk, let alone talk for the hour or so that it takes me to record an episode. I would like to thank those who wished me good health on the show's Facebook page. Unfortunately, it didn't do much to help the cold I was suffering from, but it did make my mind feel better, so thank you. This week, we will have a pretty information-dense episode as we discuss the economic situation of some of the countries in 1915. Today, we will mostly focus on three countries, Austria, Russia, and France. However, Britain and Germany will make a small appearance, but I'm holding the most of the discussion on their specific economic situation until later in the year, when it will connect a bit more with a larger story. However, before we drop into those three countries, we will talk about the most acute economic problem in the opening months of the war, artillery shells. The lack of artillery shells was a problem for all of the countries in the First World War, and 1915 would be the year when it was the most impactful. No one could have foreseen, before the war, the amount of artillery ammunition that would be needed, and the countries had failed to properly prepare their production facilities. This failure to prepare was partially due to a fact that Norman Stone discusses in his book, The Eastern Front. Quote, The calculation that war would be short owed much more to prevailing ideas of economics. The advanced nations of the West could not possibly allow disruption of trade for more than a few months, or their economies would collapse. Now this sort of idea that these economies would collapse after just a few months of this like wartime exertion would obviously prove not to be the case. But since so much of the pre-war planning was done based on these uh, sort of estimations, it would start causing big problems for everybody. Now the First World War would be the first and last major war, in which more men were killed by artillery than by any other means of destruction. For the first three years of the war, it was really the only way that there was any chance of the enemy defenses being suppressed. In the years before the war, nobody could fathom the appetite for shells that the armies in the field would have in 1914. And it was because of this lack of understanding that the countries of Europe made a mistake that G.J. Meyer describes in his book, A World Undone. Quote, In the years leading up to 1914, all the powers had spent heavily on artillery. In addition to its heavy artillery, Germany began the war with more than 5,000 smaller field guns and 1,200 field howitzers, for example and all entered the conflict with what they thought were immense quantities of ammunition. All were stunned by the speed with which their supplies were exhausted. When 1915 arrived, with both fronts deadlocked, all the belligerents found themselves desperately short, not just of shells, but of production capacity. Now when the war started, the French thought they had about three months of supply, the British thought they had six, and the Russians had a thousand rounds per gun. All of this was exhausted well before the end of 1914. The Russians were, of course, running out far sooner than everybody else. Uh, After all, guns were firing a thousand rounds a week, let alone in the entire war. This emphasis in stockpiling, rather than growing the ability to produce, would come back to haunt all of the countries, as they found themselves grappling with trying to drastically grow their economic throughput while also fighting a war. Another problem was in the type of shells that had been stockpiled. All the nations had put a heavy emphasis on shrapnel shells. These were perfect for doing damage to troops in the open, or in light fortifications. 
but as the troops entrenched, they were almost completely worthless. What the artillery needed was high explosive shells, which were much more complicated to make and more expensive to produce. Even with these increased difficulties, the high explosive shells were in so much demand that the nations were forced to switch almost all of their production over to them pretty early in the war. So, when the countries discovered that they didn't have even close to enough shells, they had to start mobilizing production capacity as quickly as possible. Now, some of the nations were more successful at this than others, and Austria-Hungary certainly fell into the other category. They would never produce more than 1 million rounds a month, even in 1916 at the height of production. They had problems both in not having very much production capacity, but also in having to produce many different kinds of rounds. They were far less standardized in their guns than other countries, which limited the amount of mass production that the factories could do. Russia was also having serious difficulties meeting the requested demand from their armies. In early 1915, the Russian High Command estimated that they would need about 2.5 million rounds of ammunition every month to get to the front. However, for the first four months of 1915, only 2 million rounds total reached the armies. This was due to many problems in Russia, the biggest of which is that they just weren't at a point in their industrial development where it was possible to scale up that high. This massive need for shells wasn't helped by the fact that there were hundreds of thousands of shells stockpiled in fortresses near the border with Germany that soon fell into German hands. This was due to some corruption, with the commanders of the fortresses hoarding shells without remorse, but was really just a breakdown in overall allocation from high command. Apparently, fortresses who weren't even engaged in the fighting were still getting monthly shipments of shells, while the men at the front had nothing. A good example of just how much disparity there was between the German and Russian shell production in May 1915, when the Germans broke through the Russian lines, one German army would have over one million shells, with the Russians facing them having just a hundred thousand. In the entire southwestern front, the Russians had just a hundred thousand shells in reserve. There were German divisions on the eastern front that had more shells than this. Now, I don't want to paint the Russians in a completely harsh light. They did manage to bring up their monthly production from about 400,000 a month in early 1915 to over a million by September. This was a huge accomplishment. The only problem was that the Germans were producing around 4 million rounds per month by the middle of 1915, and it only grew from there. Now, the Germans were forced to quickly ramp up their production after using more shells in the Battle of the Marne than they had used in the entire Franco-Prussian War. The German buildup of production would be led by a German industrialist named Walter Rathau. Rathenau led the German chemical and engineering industries to do absolutely incredible things. They were cut off from a lot of supplies used to make wartime materials due to the blockade from Britain. Therefore, they had to find alternatives to traditional sources. This meant finding a way to extract chamfer, an essential component of gunpowder, from turpentine. Nitrogen, acetone, nitroglycerin, all were items that were previously imported that they found a way to produce from items that they had at hand. During both world wars, I think that the Germans definitely get the MacGyver Award for doing awesome stuff with the resources available. Seriously, read into all of the synthetic materials that Germans were able to conjure up during the two world wars when they were cut off from overseas resources. It's pretty impressive. What really mattered, though, was that by the summer of 1915, German factories were churning out around 4 million shells a month. The French were trying to keep pace, with Albert Thomas, who, as Undersecretary of Armaments, was one of the primary advocates for getting skilled laborers out of the trenches and back into factories. With the half of a million workers that were released from combat duty, the French were slowly saw their production rise, but it was never enough to satiate the ever-expanding needs of the army. In Britain, the lack of artillery shells making their way to the front would cause enough of a problem that it would force changes within the entire government. After the Battle of New Chapelle, the London Times ran an article titled Need for Shells, British Attacks Checked, Limited Supply the Cause, A Lesson from France. It seems that General Haig had a part in getting this article ran, using his connections at the Times to push his agenda of giving command of the BEF away from Sir John French. This news 
coupled with the ever-lengthening saga of Gallipoli, caused the Asquith government to fall. This was probably more of an effect than Haig was hoping for, but nonetheless, it was the reality. The public outcry from the article would cause a huge shakeup in the government that would lead to an increase in production, but much like everybody else, the British were unable to even come close to meeting the demands of the army in 1915. So what this sort of like shortage resulted in is that armies were constantly having to wait to go on the attack so that they could stockpile artillery ammunition. And when that ammunition was stockpiled, they basically had to strip the entire front except for where they were going to launch the attack. You can see this evident in the French attacks all throughout the year or in the British attacks where the only way that they could keep from limiting the artillery in the attack was to essentially take all of their production capacity and funnel it into a few miles of front. Now this is okay when the Germans aren't attacking back or when the attacks are on a very small scale. But as they tried to scale up their attacks, as to they tried to make them bigger, they started running into problems. And this wasn't just on the Western Front or the Eastern Front. This was everywhere. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. So that is enough about artillery shells for the moment. Let's take a trip over to Austria-Hungary to look at their specific economic situation. I would like to specifically call out Norman Stone's book, The Eastern Front, which was a great resource for this bit of the episode. Now he starts off his discussion of the empire's economic situation rather ominously, with these words, quote, The Habsburg monarchy had become incapable of harnessing its people's energies. End quote. Now the first big problem that Austria-Hungary had was simply in manpower. I believe I mentioned this back in episode 21 or so, but it bears discussing again, given the importance. So in 1914, there were 3.5 million men who were called up, basically every trained fighting man in the empire, and of course losses happened. And by March 1915, casualties were in the 2 million range. So Austria-Hungary found themselves in a position that all of the other countries in the war would experience, just roughly two years earlier than anybody else. This position was one where they were strictly reliant on the current year's class of conscripts to make good their losses. I'm sure you can understand how bad this situation is. When you are constantly experiencing attrition at the front, and all you have are the men turning 18 at any given time to replace them with, there is no way for you to really keep those numbers up over the long term. The manpower problems were further complicated due to the huge number of nationalities in the empire's armies. This is a problem pretty much unique to the Austro-Hungarian armies, in that soon after the war started, there were units of men who literally did not speak the same language as their commanding officer. This was of course a problem before the war as well, but in the time of peace, there was time for a new officer to take the time to learn the language of his men, at least enough to converse, and also to teach his men at least some German. Now, German was the official language of the army. The benefits to communication is obvious, but a less obvious side effect was the connection this made between the officers and the men. The officers would learn something of their men, 
After all, the groups were very diverse in the empire, and it wasn't like all of the ethnicities were the same. Sure, some were peasants who had very little exposure to the outside world, but there were large groups that were highly literate and had been skilled laborers in the cities before the war. By learning about each other, the officers and men would begin to form a bond. This bond would go a long way to helping minorities like the Slavs or the Croats feel like they were a part of an empire that was worth fighting for. This was particularly important when you consider that two-thirds of the officers were either German or Austrian, and most of the rest were Hungarian. Now all of this changed after the war started, and the huge attrition rate among the officers took hold. As the old group of officers were put out of action, the new set didn't have the time, and sometimes didn't have the desire, to connect with the men under them in the same way. To quote Norman Stone again, quote, Men froze, resented injustices at home, did not know what their officers were saying, and had not much artillery support to help them in the field, and sometimes understood Russian better than any other language. Desertion began. End quote. We then move on to production capacity. At the start of the war, the Austrians had less guns than the Russians, uh, about a third less. But since the Russian guns were also fighting the Germans, it isn't unlikely that at any given time, the Russians had an artillery advantage on the front, at least in terms of raw numbers. They were woefully inadequately supplied with ammunition, of course, uh, producing in a month less than what was being expended in a week. Also, and this is a problem that wasn't nearly as prevalent anywhere else on the front, but Austria had lost a thousand guns to the Russians. Earlier in the war, the Austro-Russian front was seesawing quite a bit back and forth, and this put the Austrian guns in harm's way far more so than on the western front. This is bad, of course, but it could have been made good with replacements from the factory, but only about 300 replacements made it to the front. With the manpower and supply problems that the army was having, by mid-1915 they were near the point of collapse, and it would be the Germans who would have to come and save them. Austria's main enemy, Russia, was also in a rather unfortunate position. The Russians were also, of course, behind on artillery shell production, but even when they had enough materials, they were being completely mishandled. Now, I touched on this a, a little earlier, but it, it bears repeating. There were literally millions of shells stuck in fortresses or in supply depots that weren't accounted for and just sat idle while the guns along the front barely had more than a few shells per day to actually shoot at the enemy. Now this wasn't just a problem for the artillery either. Similar problems were being experienced on all forms of material, even such simple supplies as rifle cartridges were in short supply by mid-1915. Part of this problem was due to the fact that all responsibility for ordering military goods fell to the War Council, which Norman Stone would describe as, quote, an institution composed of, even for Russian circumstances, extraordinarily aged generals, end quote. This group would become known for its penny-pinching early in the war. This miserly attitude was only made worse by one of the Russians' self-imposed problems early in the war. Now, the artillery department didn't think that the Russian industry was capable of producing war goods of sufficient quantity, so they were quick to look to outside suppliers. This lack of faith in Russian industry wasn't just in artillery either. The war ministry only really interacted with a small percentage of the Russian industrial base, relying on this small percentage to place its orders. When these factories were put under the strain caused by war, obviously they couldn't keep up. This was made worse when laborers were sent to the front, just like in other countries. When the problems developed, instead of convincing the war ministers that they should expand their industrial base in Russia, they instead assumed that it was just meant that the Russians were completely hopeless when it came to trying to meet the demand of the army. So they began to rely even more heavily on foreign sources of goods. The war ministry simply took the view that if they relied on Russian industry, they would find themselves paying high prices, often inflated from corruption, for crappy goods that were almost never delivered on time. There were people in the government and in the army that were trying to convince the War Council to push production out to the rest of the Russian industry, but they found that they were constantly running into brick walls. Even as late as 1916, most of the private chemical industry 
was still producing consumer cosmetics, using many of the same chemicals that were being used in other countries to make explosives. Now, you can imagine how having a cheap government, or a cheap group of ministers, and then them believing that they need to pay the crazy high markup that they were having to pay overseas would cause supply problems, and making them unwilling to make the orders that were necessary to really meet the demands of the armies. Now, this mindset of not being able to really utilize an entire country's production base wasn't a Russian problem, specifically. The the French would make many of the same mistakes earlier in the war as well. I believe it's just another example of the governments around Europe trying to cope with the massive war demands being placed on their country and trying to fit them into the small constraints of the pre-war military-industrial processes, which would have had to scale a thousand times to be able to meet the demand something that they were obviously incapable of. Now, unlike Russia, a lot of the other countries were better able to sort of break out of this mindset and to quickly realize that it just wasn't going to work. Germany was one of the early countries to break out of this mindset, but they were really forced to because, unlike uh, Russia, they didn't have the option of contracting with foreign factories to get their goods. And so Russia had the option of doing this, and so most of their orders fell onto the businesses in England and then in the United States. There were huge orders placed to the United States for rifles and to Britain for artillery shells. The American orders were constantly being delayed and delayed again. Months after the weapons were supposed to be in Russian hands, one of the Russian Grand Dukes, employed by the artillery department, would say, quote, They have unconscionably lied to us. It has been one long wicked piece of deception, end quote. Now this was because both the United States and British factories were of course busy making material for the British army. Now the reliance of Russia on Britain went even deeper than these specific orders. Now essentially Britain was acting as a banker for Russia. This was mostly due to the huge amount of foreign investments that Britain had, which created a situation where it could bankroll just about anything. But they wouldn't bankroll the Russian war effort blindly and they insisted on Russian gold being shipped to the home isles before most purchases could be made. So on October 1914, 8 million British pounds of Russian gold was sent via ship to Britain. Now it's hard to get exactly what this is in 2015 British pounds, but some random internet people tell me that it's something like 250 million pounds, or somewhere around 375 million US dollars. With so much of Russian imports coming through, or being financed by Britain. The Russians found themselves in a bit of a pickle. They had to order through Britain, but that meant it was very easy for the British to up the prices just a bit to get a bit more profit. It wasn't long before the Russians realized this, of course, but it was difficult to figure a way out. While this problem was happening, the Russian ruble essentially dropped in value by half during early 1916. This made it impossible to get orders from other countries. Throughout this entire time, the British insisted that this was the best way to go about it for the Russians, insisting that if the Russians were able to make massive orders independently abroad, it would just drive up the price for everybody. So I've I've spewed a lot of information there, so let's just take a step back to review the Russian situation. The government didn't trust local production to create quality material at the quantities required, so they were forced to import their supplies. Due to Britain's position in the market, it was able to guarantee Russian finances, so the Russians were forced to pay high markups for goods to flow through Britain. Now this was something that couldn't continue throughout the entire war, and in fact there would become a point in a few years when the British would basically be throwing money at the Russians in the forms of gun and shells to try to keep them afloat in the war, but that would be after Russian foreign debt had exploded from the practices of the first few years of the war. While the Russian army was experiencing supply difficulties, and some of it exacerbated by their own hoarding practices, the soldiers were also becoming less reliable. Part of the problem was that there just weren't enough officers being trained compared to the size of the army. In all of the armies, after the initial excitement of being in the army wore off the men, it became very important to have officers to keep things moving along, both during idle times as well as during battles. Norman Stone goes into great detail about this problem, and I will try to do my best to summarize what he says, 
And then this is like several pages of his text, so I'm going to try and get it down to like two sentences here. Basically, the Russians refused to promote men from their ranks, depending on aristocratic recruits to be trained instead. By the end of 1915, there were regiments with 3,000 men with less than a dozen officers. The problem was just as bad, if not worse, in the NCO Corps. In Western armies, to this very day, the NCO, or non-commissioned officer, is really the heart of the unit and what keeps it moving. In the Russian army of the First World War, these men were recruited from the ranks, but didn't have the same level of power or respect as they did in other armies. Part of the problem was that there wasn't a great base of educated men in Russia, like the Germans, French, or British, could call upon for leaders in the ranks. At the start of the war, most of these NCOs in Germany came from men with long military experience, and there were something like 12 per company. The Russians had just two per company. When you are bringing in so many raw recruits, having a backbone of experienced men in leadership positions cannot possibly be overstated in importance. So there was this wide gap between the number of officers that were available and the number of officers that were needed. The officers, for their part, were not exactly high on the capabilities of the men under their command. They thought of them to be mostly uneducated masses that were good for nothing other than to be shoved into battle. This, of course, led to resentment in the ranks that, instead of being handled by sympathy and understanding, just caused the officers to double down on their negative thoughts of the men. The men were compelled by force, if necessary, to continue fighting. As is often the case, this coercion by force had some positive short-term results, with some very negative long-term consequences, as it would accelerate the events of 1917 and the withdrawal of Russia from the war. As the war continued to drag on, the economies of all the countries were mobilized more and more to meet the demands of the armies. After discussing so many failures today, it will be interesting to revisit the topic in the future, when the economies of other countries of the war, Germany, France, Britain, had begun to really operate at peak efficiency. In 1914, I'm sure none of the governments knew what would be required to keep fighting. Norman Stone would say, quote, The discovery that states could go on fighting the war with bits of paper for money took almost everyone by surprise. End quote. The fighting would soon cost the countries millions of dollars a week. And honestly, I think it is somewhat impressive that they were able to keep going as long as they did. Now, this hasn't been the most action-packed episode, but I can't emphasize enough how important the economic aspect of the war was. In both the world wars, it would be a nation's ability to keep its army supplied that would be the biggest cause of victory, or defeat. Don't worry, though. Next week, we are back in the action as we discuss the sinking of the Lusitania and its great effects on the war moving forward, especially when it comes to bringing in the Great Neutral, the United States.